Hello. So, great to be here again, uh, second time. Uh, yeah, today I want to talk to you about the work we did as the Prometheus team over the last one and a half or almost two years. Uh, and it's about Prometheus 2. Um, so we have done a lot of great improvements, as Liz said. Um, but first, let's take a look at where we are with Prometheus today. So um, across our official repositories, we are counting about 900 contributors. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, on our IC channel, there are about 800 people online at any given time, um, asking questions, helping each other. Um, and we're listing about 150 integrations in various aspects with Prometheus on our official website. But the actual number is probably way higher by now. Um, in terms of adoption, um, GitHub Stars is actually the closest number we have to track that, uh, so we don't sort of have any installation tracking. Um, but it's a pretty good measure, roughly, um, to estimate how well Prometheus is being adopted and doing. Um, and based on that, which is the blue line here, um, we are still on a slightly exponential growth slope. So overall, we are pretty healthy and doing well. But how did we get here? Uh, I think most of you have only heard about Prometheus within the last one or two years, but it actually started out way, way earlier, so almost six years ago, or five and a half, in 2012, when it was started as a side project by SoundCloud engineers. And it took a while until March 2014 uh, for the first minor version to actually be cut. Uh, and this version was then used internally at SoundCloud, and progressively more and more teams sort of onboarded onto Prometheus, and it became quite a popular monitoring system. But only in the following year, in January, um, Prometheus was actually publicly announced, and that's, for example, when I joined the project. Um, and from there on, things took basically off pretty rapidly. Uh, and one important milestone in hindsight is probably that um, we added something that we call the Service Discovery Integration Framework, which sounds like super boring. Um, but it's really important um, because it really allowed people to easily add integrations with their environments to Prometheus directly, um, which then allowed more users to just come, grab Prometheus, drop it in their environment, and basically get started without any further configuration or modification to the rest of the environment. And later in the same year, we actually added Kubernetes discovery to this integration framework, um, which basically allows you now um, to just run Prometheus inside of Kubernetes, and as soon as you schedule a pod somewhere, it will be immediately picked up and monitored, and if it disappears, Prometheus just detects this as well. Um, yeah. In the following year, in May, we joined the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, as a second project after Kubernetes, so I think we at least somewhat shaped the term Cloud Native in the early days there. And later in the same year, we finally released Prometheus 1.0, which was, of course, really important for many organizations because they could now trust that Prometheus would be stable for a certain amount of time in terms of APIs, query language configuration, etc. Um, and then we kind of figured that people want to go further. They want to scale out Prometheus. And we wanted to give them the means to explore these areas. And we did so by adding remote APIs, which allow you to basically stream out data from Prometheus into any other system. This is mostly meant for long-term storage solutions, but it's also used by certain vendors to um, basically offer customers to use Prometheus to feed data into their backend. But we also noticed something. Um, more and more users were coming to us and reporting that Prometheus was struggling a bit performance-wise. Um, they were having hard times turning all the performance knobs to make Prometheus stable. Um, and after some debugging, it all boiled down, unfortunately, to the time series database. This was problematic because we actually were already on our custom time series database because all the other open source solutions were not quite performant enough. So the only other option was essentially, OK, let's write another one. And that's what we started doing. And in November of the same year, so six months ago, we actually released this as Prometheus 2. So let's take a quick look at what the problem actually was. Um, if you think of legacy environments or most environments today, um, it's, it's a pretty dense picture. So you have a few services that are running, they expose metrics, and then you collect, continuously collect new data points for these metrics. Um, so you might be tracking in a single Prometheus server about 10 million time series, and every 30 seconds you add one data point to each of them. Now in cloud native environments, things become a bit more dynamic. Um, you have stuff like uh, continuous running deployments, which allow you to deploy 10 times a day. Uh, you have horizontal auto scaling, which allows you to adapt, adapt to um, current performance or uh, performance demands. Um, and the time series become much, much shorter. They go from weeks to months to just a few days or even just hours, uh, which looks fine, right? It's like fewer points here, but of course, your total compute didn't go down. Uh, it just sort of spread out more. 
and then you end up with this rather sparse picture here. You have a lot of really short time series, and you're adding more and more every single day. So Prometheus back then had to handle um, about 10 million time series, but now it has to handle a billion and more. And the database that can um, do the latter is, of course, much harder than the former. So we wrote a new one, um, and essentially what we had to do was we needed an improved way to index and address time series in the database um, to make queries perform even as we added more and more series over time. And we did that, that worked, nice. Um, but we also made some other big improvements um, along virtually all performance dimensions by, by really the sort of squeezing uh, every drop out of it. Uh, and by the end, this sort of time series database library um, could handle about one million samples per second per CPU core, which is arguably way overshooting our goals here. Um, but it's nice to know uh, that we can do this. And uh, what was quite important to us from the beginning was that this is a standalone library because we're getting more and more people requesting certain one-off features that are perfectly valid in, in the environment, but they are not really generally applicable. And we cannot add APIs for every possible use case to Prometheus, but if we get, give people tools in their hands to build these things themselves and share them with the community, um, they can get the problem addressed without um, having to wait for us. So this TSB library um, comes with an open um, storage format and with a really easy to use API that people can then use to build custom tooling. Damn it. Uh, okay, so the next step was integrating this into Prometheus. And this was quite a problem um, because every, everything changed. <laughs> and we also noticed that now that we had the TSB be so efficient, um, every other sort of aspect of Prometheus was sort of showing up in the performance profiles. So to really reap all these performance benefits, we had to basically go back and optimize all these layers as well. And one major part of this was the scraping layer, so the part that goes out um, and queries new data points from your services. Um, and we did some really low-level stuff there based on the text exposition format um, of Prometheus. Um, and for the time being, we dropped the protobuf support, uh, but this should not affect any users um, since Basically, all libraries support both. So, benchmarks. Um, you probably really don't know how this all worked out. And what we did to ensure that this is actually on track of what we wanted to do, we had a benchmarking setup, um, which is basically a Kubernetes cluster, which is running a few hundred pods, and these get rotated at a really fast pace to really simulate these short lived series. So, every 10 minutes, we would swap out 20% of our pods in this cluster and spin up new ones. Yeah. The absolute numbers are not so important. Um, just take a look at the roughly rough shape of these graphs here uh, and the relationship between version 1 and version 2. Uh, and this here is about memory consumption. And I mean, quite obviously, you can see that Prometheus 2 in the bottom is doing much better here than Prometheus 1. Um, but almost more important is that Prometheus 1 sort of slowly creeps up in memory consumption, then levels out a bit, and that makes a big jump again. So in the worst case, you have to wait two to four weeks before you actually know whether the resources you gave to your Prometheus server are sufficient for it to fulfill its task. And Prometheus 2 is doing much better here, since basically it has like a one hour warm up time and then jumps to its baseline and then stays there pretty reliably. And the same goes essentially for CPU consumption. Um, so again, Prometheus 2 is doing much, much better here in the bottom. It has some spikes, they are really predictable. Uh, whereas Prometheus 1, um, yeah, slowly creeps up again in usage and then makes a big jump after some time. Yeah, and total savings, as we can see. Um, interesting is the bottom one, um, because this is sort of the pure ingestion path of scraping new data. And in this setup here, we are scraping, what, 300,000 data points per second, and this barely even uses half a CPU core. And the biggest improvement by far, <laughs> like almost full, two orders of magnitude, um, is this guy all. So we knew that Prometheus 1 had some problems in really big setups, uh, where SSDs tended to burn out after like a year or one and a half, uh, which wasn't good, um, but it wasn't a major issue. Um, but actually, after Prometheus 2 was complete, uh, we realized, OK, actually, it was pretty bad. <laughs> so in these benchmarks here, we see that at times it's fighting up to 100 megabytes per second to disk, um, whereas Prometheus 2 here is barely using like one or two megabytes per second with some really periodic and predictably low, low spikes. And the most surprising thing was by far that actually Prometheus 2 uses less disk space, 
uh, the sample compression we're using in either version is exactly the same, so this shouldn't change anything. Um, but turns out in Prometheus 1, the baseline cost in terms of storage for a single time series is quite high. Um, and in Prometheus 2, we are sort of able to pack this together way, way better. And then in extreme cases, like um, this benchmark setup here, you can see performance improvements or storage savings up to 4x. And the last thing is um, query latency. That's actually the original cause why we had to build this whole thing, right? After a certain time, queries became just very, very slow. Um, and here we can see that Prometheus 1 behaves exactly this way. So it starts out at a really low latency and then slowly um, creeps up linearly as we add more and more series to our storage. And Prometheus 2 in return starts out at the same latency. So they have the same baseline, I guess. Um, but then it stays there and doesn't creep up over time. So this is sort of the core goal um, which we have then achieved. So in any way we kind of measured it and held it, uh, Prometheus 2 is doing much, much better than Prometheus 1. So this is really good. Um, but of course, we did some other things as well, because we had this opportunity to get rid, get rid of some sort of nasty things in Prometheus, because we're cutting a new major version. Um, and one of them is that we got rid of our custom DSL to define rules, like alerting, for example, um, simply because our DSL didn't add anything. It didn't reduce complexity. It didn't increase expressiveness. Um, so we just figured, let's go with YAML. It's great anyway. Um, but it's just much, easy, much easier to build custom templating around it, um, or any other tools, really, instead of having people to deal with yet another DSL. Another more subtle thing that's probably barely noticeable, but really, really important, is stainless handling. Um, so one problem in time series-based monitoring is that you don't really know when a time series ends. You don't know whether it's actually terminated for good or it will just receive another sample a bit later. Um, and what you usually end up doing is you define a timeout that sort of finds a good middle ground between um, latency and time to detection um, uh, with false positives. But thanks to Prometheus being a pull-based system, we can actually, um, at scrape time, um, if you encounter an error, say, okay, all time series you have seen from this monitoring target before, let's terminate them and set a termination marker. And then in our query engine, when we encounter such a termination marker, we know that this series is gone for good and not waiting for another sample to come sooner or later. And this makes your alerts more responsive, so you go from time to detection and whether the process is down of like five minutes to basically one scrap interval or less. Um, and it also reduces a lot of really odd artifacts that you might see in graphs and subsequently also your alerts. So um, we did some other things as well. We removed some deprecated stuff, but that's sort of covering the major basis. Um, so next for Prometheus is essentially improving query engine performance. Um, you might have seen in the graphs before that, yeah, the query Prometheus servers were using quite a bit more resources. That's fine to a degree, um, but we just know that there's a lot of, sort of room left behind because the query engine at this point is pretty naive, and we have some good work in progress here um, that is improving a great deal on this. Uh, we also want to reinvestigate GRPC um, for our APIs. So we have certainly a few points where it could improve performance quite a bit, and also the type safety is quite useful in some cases. Um, the remote APIs that I've mentioned before, they are officially still experimental, even though people are using them. Um, they were mostly meant to figure out what people need, what people want these APIs for, and so the next step is, okay, let's, let's take all the things we learned and build something better, um, which first and foremost means more performance, uh, and secondly also can we provide better semantical guarantees around the data we send out to the party systems. Um, lastly, we want to stay engaged with open metrics, which is sort of a working group between different open source projects and vendors um, to come up with a new sort of monitoring standard. And um, as soon as any sort of standard emerges from there, uh, we want to adapt this as soon as possible to sort of lead by a good example and be a good member of the community. Um, as you've seen, there's still no long-term storage on this roadmap um, because we are still pretty firm on this. It's not a problem we want to solve. So Prometheus is going to stay um, sort of single node, single server focused. Um, but by providing these integration points, we really want to make it easy to build great tools around this or new third-party solutions. And we've actually seen a few of those. So I think the first one was uh, WeFox Cortex, um, which uses a remote API to store data in something like Cassandra, Bigtable, or DynamoDB. Um, InfluxDB is doing a lot of great work 
to integrate with this API and provide, I think, even from QL support. Um, and another interesting thing is Thanos, uh, which is not based on the remote APIs, but instead works directly on this new um, Prometheus 2.0 storage format and allows to cluster different Prometheus servers together um, via a sidecar. So if you want long-term storage and are really sure you need it, um, you probably want to look at one of those. Lastly, um, there's finally a book coming out by one of our maintainers, Brian Brazil. Um, as far as I've understood, everybody here should get this for free for 30 days. So if you want to learn about Prometheus, this is probably the best place to start. Um, and otherwise, a bunch of really good talks, I think, for the next few days um, to yeah, learn more about Prometheus. So overall, yeah, I think Prometheus has been quite successful for us. Uh, yeah, and thanks. Enjoy the rest of the conference.